Diane, you knew that they were drinking antifreeze. Mm -hmm. You knew that. They didn't. We both know that. You knew, Diane, that they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. I've screwed up everybody. I've screwed up my own family. Once upon a time, there were six. Now there are three. Only the quiet one lives. My mother, my little sister, and me. This chilling poem contained a dark secret of the Stoute family and turned out to be a crucial piece of evidence in the case. Let's first explore the dynamics of the Stoute family. In 2012, Mark and Diane Stoute led seemingly ordinary lives in Springfield, Missouri. Mark, 61, was a vocalist in a local blues band, while 51-year-old Diane, a trained nurse, served as the organist at the Redeemer Lutheran Church. The couple had four children, Sean, 26, who had autism, Sarah, 24, was a high school graduate but was unemployed with student loans, Rachel, 22, was Diane's favorite and excelled in music and was active in the church, and nine-year-old Brianna, who had learning disabilities. Despite facing tough times, the Stoute family appeared tightly knit. However, tragedy struck in 2012 when Mark Stoute fell ill and passed away from a heart attack. The misfortune continued as 26-year-old Sean began exhibiting similar symptoms and succumbed to sickness in September 2012. After this, Diane and her three daughters were left to grieve. In June 2013, Diane Stoute's eldest daughter, Sarah, was hospitalized in critical condition after being unresponsive and sick for nearly a week. Diane sought prayers for Sarah's well-being on Facebook. Simultaneously, an anonymous tip to the Missouri Homicide Department suggested that it wasn't the first time that the Stoute family had faced this sort of tragedy. What did the caller say exactly? That Diane Stoute might be responsible for two or three homicides. Again, brought up Mark's death, Sean's death being very uh, close proximity to each other. Also spoke about the potential that Sarah was going to die as well. So the caller was essentially blowing the whistle on Diane Stoute. Correct, yes. All right. Is it Stout? Stouty. Stouty? Okay. Uh, well, again, Miss Stouty, I, I appreciate you being willing to come down and speak with us. You are very helpful on your part. I try to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Don't I'll, know what I can tell you. Well, okay. Well, that's what we're going to try and get figured out. Um, obviously, like I told you, Alice, it's, we got the call about Sarah and, and her condition, but you say she's doing better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when did all this come about? She started feeling sick Saturday, you know, just a mild this headache. Past, this yeah, past Saturday? This past, well, it's been a whole week. Oh, so how, how did all that come about? She started, Saturday, she complained of a little headache, mm -hmm. and she was her stomach was upset and she threw up a couple of times and that was it and then her, her normal routine is she stays up all night and sleeps during the day so I didn't think any about it until Sunday afternoon and then I couldn't get her to wake up she didn't respond to me so we took her to the emergency room okay so you on Saturday then you said she was having some headaches and throwing up. Uh huh. But it wasn't that bad. Yeah, not I that. mean, I've seen the flu bug worse. Okay. So I, I didn't think that much about it. About what time was that on Saturday? Oh, that was in the afternoon. Okay. And then you remember what about what time it was that she went to bed? Oh gosh, I don't know. I I really don't know because I I go to bed at ten. Okay. At night, and she's usually still up. Okay. And then you woke up Sunday morning. Morning. And she was asleep. Okay. Then what happened? Um, me and the other girls went to church and we left her sleeping. Okay. And then I came home and she was still sleeping. And then maybe a couple hours later, I went to check on her and we just couldn't get her to respond or answer or anything. Okay. So you brought her to the ER, yeah. and that was Sunday. That at was Sunday night. Um, I want to say afternoon. Afternoon. It was still daylight. Okay. Okay. So after you get home from church, you go in to check on her. She's still uh -huh. asleep, but she just will not respond. Right. She's completely unresponsive. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. And um, what time about was it that you got home from church? Uh, I want to say around twelve thirty. Okay. And then 
sometime you say in the afternoon it was still light mm -hmm. out do mm -hmm. you remember about what time it was that you took her to the ER maybe three-ish okay something like that all right she was is she still unresponsive at that point pretty much yeah okay I mean we, we literally had to Rachel and I had to carry her oh we wow. carried her to the car okay all right that's like okay this is not good <laughs> you mm -hmm. know it's like something's wrong mm-hmm all right and what did they what did they say at the hospital uh basically she was as sick as sick could get but no idea what it was we had no clue still don't really have a clue i mean with, with her medical background she's bipolar okay my first thing is did she get into something you know did she try to overdose or something and then when i got home from the er i checked her medicine and she had plenty of pills left, so I don't think she OD'd her medicine, but I have no clue. Based on the information from this tip, Detective Neil McAmis started investigating the case. A bizarre pattern was found. Both Mark and Sean had very similar symptoms before dying, which were now being seen in Sarah as well. To get more clarity, Diane was summoned to the sheriff's office. In this part, Detective Neil McAmis starts building a rapport with Diane related to Sarah's current and past health condition and what led to her being in such a serious state. Diane's body posture so far looks calm and relaxed. Her clarity in speech and clear eye contact with the detective reflects a positive approach from her side. However, it's important to note that she isn't aware of the information that Detective McAmis has against her. So it's safe to say that she has started well with her pretense. I really don't. So it didn't look like to you then that she would have overdosed? No, on her and bed. then I, I, you know, when I'm telling the ER folks, you know, this is her history, and I know they were probably running every test under the sun on her, and they said nothing, they, they couldn't figure it out either. Okay. If she wouldn't have, obviously, because the pills were there, if she wouldn't have overdosed on pills, you know what else she might have done? She's talked about in the past about cutting her wrist, um, but as far as other ways, I have no clue. Okay, she's obviously really never she didn't, said anything. But, but obviously then, she didn't cut her wrist no, in general, okay. No. So you don't know how else she might have done it? No. Okay. I mean I if she did find something to take, I have no clue. Okay. You have any idea what it would be that she'd find to take? As far as pills, I don't have much mm -hmm. <laughs> other, you know, Tylenol, Motrin, that type mm -hmm. of stuff. But Anything else maybe besides pills or that she could do? Well, if she got into like cleaners and stuff like that, but I don't know. I can't really picture her doing that. Okay. You don't, so you don't think she's the type of person that would try to harm herself? or? I really don't know. I'm, I don't know. Okay. Part of me says yeah, part of me says no. I don't know. Has she, did she mention anything about, you know, wanting to harm herself or no. nothing at all? No. Okay. No. I, I know she had been not sleeping as good as she's been in the past, but other than that, I hadn't really noticed much change. Okay. But then, you know, I don't know. It's, it's so subtle sometimes, you just never know what's mm -hmm. going on. Sure. And it's tough, because I, I try to give her her space, but yet I want to kind of know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You said you have other daughters? Mm -hmm. How many do you have? I have two others. How old are they? Uh, 22 and 11. Would they, would they know? Would um, Sarah have maybe said something to them about wanting to harm herself? I asked or? them and they said they hadn't, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. So you don't think it was pills? You thought maybe she could have got into some cleaners or something? Yeah, because I, I know I have cleaners and I don't, what else is there? Yeah. While Diane initially hints at Sarah's past mental health issues and self-harm as a potential explanation for the poisoning, she eventually acknowledges that this is not a plausible excuse. Consequently, she shifts the conversation to the topic of household cleaners. Despite almost losing her daughter to poisoning, Diane's behavior is unexpectedly detached. She giggles while discussing the possibility that household cleaners could have caused Sarah's poisoning. 
The detective notices this emotional distance, which becomes more evident in subsequent interactions, shedding light on the underlying reasons. What kind of cleaners do you think it could have been that she would have? What do I have? I can't see her taking soap. <laughs> Yuck. Um, the general, you know, everyday cleaner. Well, I have some of that. What's, what would that be? Oh, what's the name of it? Lysol? Okay. I know I have that, but I don't... Could you, could you even hurt yourself from soap or Lysol, do you know? I'm not... I have no clue. No, okay. <laughs> I, I don't even think about... Right. I've just like never that. heard of anything like that, so I don't... I haven't either. It's like, but I, I guess... I don't know. I guess if you took enough, something would do something, mm -hmm. but I've never... I don't know. Okay. But she's, as far as you know, she hasn't mentioned anything at all to anybody no. about wanting to harm herself. So no. that would kind of surprise you. It, it, yeah. Okay. Hmm. And as far as you know, they still don't know anything at the hospital? No. No. Gosh. Other than whatever happened really did a number on her. I really don't know. I've... I've been trying to rack my brains trying to figure out what happened so and from what I understand you you're um, in the medical field mm -hmm. I'm a nurse you're a nurse okay but I'm a cardiology mm -hmm. nurse I know hearts but yeah okay um, okay and from what I understand too um, I think you're pretty well respected in your profession mm -hmm. is that correct and yeah. you, so you is there anything from your knowledge, I know you say you, you deal with the heart and stuff, but from your knowledge, is there anything that you could think of that it could have been? Because obviously from what we understand, you're pretty intelligent. Yeah. You're, you know, I mean, this is- I a, try. Yeah. But I, I really can't think of anything. I mean, I don't know. Psych's not my thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I understand that. That's a whole different realm mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, just, yeah, I understand the psych part, but in terms of like medical condition yeah. wise, is there anything medical condition medical wise that, that would you cause all this? The only thing I'm thinking in my mind is unless it's an autoimmune something or the other, but I've never heard of that causing. You know, basically she had a total body collapse. Okay. I mean, all her organs were trying to fail, and it's like I don't know if anything. That would do all of that. Yeah. Maybe one thing, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Diane's nonchalant demeanor and apparent lack of concern regarding the cause of Sarah's severe condition raises significant red flags. Detective McAmis observes this and attempts to delve deeper into the reasons behind her behavior. He asks an open-ended question about what possibility makes the most sense to Diane. However, her attempt to dodge the questions and give unclear answers makes a detective more suspicious about her being involved. As more specific questions are posed, Diane continues to deflect them. If she did take some cleaners or something, could that, I mean, could that essentially? Well, I can see that hurt in the kidneys, but that wouldn't cause her brain. I mean, she had a brain bleed. Oh, she had a brain yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's like, that's, I can't figure that one out. Because hmm. I even asked, it's like, you're sure it's a bleed, not a stroke, you know, or a blood clot? Because that runs in my family, so. But they said it was a bleed, and it's like, what would do that? Strokes or blood clots run in your family? Uh -huh. but both, or, I'm sorry, strokes? Well, it's the same or... thing. Oh, okay. You, okay. Can, you can throw a blood clot to the brain, and that causes a stroke. Okay. And that runs in your family? Uh -huh. Like how far? Well, I've had a TIA. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, that's like a tra um, mini stroke. Okay. And then my mom had one and her mom died of a stroke. Okay. But. Would it be common for somebody that her age though? That, because from my understanding, Sarah was in really good. Yeah, she was in good, I as mean, far as we know, she health, was in good health. great physical health, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and at her age, the only thing I can see is if she was on birth control pills, but 
she wasn't. I mean, I, I keep thinking, what drug is there that would do that? Because it almost sounds like a drug overdose, but I can't think of what. And but her talk did she came get back it? with with absolutely nothing, nothing in her system. Nothing. So we can eliminate that then. Yeah. What are the cleaners? If if that was the case, would that? Could I that, would think. I would think even that something in there would show up. Okay. How would that show up? I don't. I don't know mm -hmm. whatever chemicals are in there. Because I know it was negative on alcohol, so I know she didn't get into the beer. Mm -hmm. But is she much of a drinker? No. No. What about drug user? Is she much of a drug no, user? Not, Nothing that, you, not that you're that aware of. Not that I know of. of. Okay. See, that makes me question. It's like, well, did she do something? Mm -hmm. And if she did, I'd sure as heck like to know what so I could prevent it again. I can't go through this again. What do you mean? This can't go through this rough. again? Oh, you mean this <laughs> whole ordeal? Okay, yeah. It's rough. I bet, especially since she almost I died. Know. Yeah. Brain bleeds typically occur in young adults due to hypertension or high blood pressure. Substance abuse, including drugs and alcohol, can also contribute to this condition. Sarah, who was previously healthy, underwent multiple tests to identify the cause of her brain bleed, and all results came back negative. This strongly suggests that there was a substance in her system responsible for her condition. Given Diane's background in the medical field, she likely has some insight into the potential causes, but she consistently evades the detective's questions by providing vague answers. She expresses a desire to avoid similar events in the future instead of understanding what went wrong with Sarah, indicating a lack of compassion for her own daughter. Where are you a nurse at? Um, I work out of the house. I work for an insurance company. Oh, okay. What do you, what do, you do for um, a nurse for an insurance company? Uh-huh. Yeah, I review claims. Oh, okay. Okay. How long have you done that? Uh, about twelve years. Wow. I love it. God, it's pretty good getting to work no, out of no the house too, me. right? I don't have to work holidays. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. You get to get to make your own schedule, or pretty much, yeah. We have flexible hours. Wow. Well, you can't beat that. Yeah. It's like yes. I wish I had flexible hours. <laughs> you have any idea where we could? what we could look for in terms of, I mean, it's just, it sounds like it's just such a, you know, an odd deal, anything at all that to give us some guidance to figure out, you know, what happened or any suggestions you could think of. I really can't think of anything. I mean, I, I really don't know. Does she work anywhere? No. No. She's been supposedly trying to find a job, but I don't think she's been trying that hard. Pardon me real quick. I'll be right back. Diane's lighthearted humor regarding her job raises doubts about her understanding of the gravity of the case and the ongoing investigation. It's the first time she speaks about her dissatisfaction with Sarah's lack of effort in job hunting. This observation is noteworthy, as this subtle hint will turn out to be a crucial piece of information in this case. Hmm. Well, well, let me ask you this, because okay. from talking with the hospital, it sounds like they're doing a bunch of tests, and they're even sending some tests off to uh -huh. labs elsewhere. They mentioned the Mayo Clinic and, oh, wow. and possibly other places, mm -hmm. just the nature of this. Do you think there's going to be anything suspicious that we that they find in all these tests that they're going to be doing? I have no clue. Okay. Cuz I, I don't even I don't even know what to look for. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if if they're looking for some kind of a chemical that you may have taken, I can't think of what it would be to even know what tests they're doing. Because from my... Does that make sense? Well, I, I see. From my understanding, it sounds like they're going to run a whole bunch of various chemical type yeah. tests, possibly, and, and just a whole bunch of other tests um, um, to see what was going on. Yeah. Um, if it would come back that there was something in there like that, how would you explain that? I don't know. Depends. I 
don't know. It depends on what if, if something did show up. I'd have to figure out what it is. And then try and figure out where did it come from. Because I don't know. Okay. Do you know much about the autopsy process? Mm, a little bit. Okay. What did they tell you about Sean's autopsy? Um, that he had a congenital kidney defect. Um, that they found quite a bit of brain damage. I'd never heard of the word gliosis before. Um, they had found where he'd had his initial stroke and then there was evidence of seizures. Okay. Because we've s spoken with the medical examiner about that. And I guess when they first did it, they really didn't look too much into if there was any types of chemicals or anything mm -hmm. at all in his system or anything else like that. But when we, we did talk to them, they they did were, were able to tell us that they just like with all autopsies, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with those, they you know they take tissue samples and hair samples and all kinds of other samples, and they yeah. basically keep them for a while. And fortunately, they still had a, have a bunch of his mm -hmm. stuff, and so they're gonna do a bunch of tests on his stuff as well. Mm, okay. okay. So if his stuff were to come back with anything like that, something similar to maybe this, what Sarah's. Mm -hmm might come back with. How would you explain that? I don't know. I really don't know. It, again, it depends on what shows up. And what do you think it might be? I don't know. I really don't know. there could be anything maybe malicious or suspicious in, involved with that? I can't think of that, you know. Would you be surprised if something like that came back? Yeah, would you? I, I think so. I think I would be surprised. Okay. I mean, Why would you I be never, surprised? Well, I never anticipated anything showing up, mm -hmm. you know. At the start of the interrogation, Detective McCamus was already informed about the case of antifreeze poisoning involving Sarah, Sean, and possibly Mark. The fact that both Mark and Sean had very similar symptoms like the flu, throwing up, and having seizures before dying points to foul play. Notice how Detective McCamus offers several chances for Diane to confess by subtly hinting at the possibility that they might have information about the culprit. Diane's repeated use of the phrase, I don't know, indicates a lack of credible explanation. You you never anticipated anything showing up. Why why would you why do you, why would you not well, anticipate anything showing up? Because I I really don't know what. How can I say this to make sense? I really don't know. Like for instance, Sarah, I don't know what happened. Right. I, and and as far as Sean, I you know I'm just taking their word that yeah. that's what happened. And I understand. And I think their initial, you know, because they didn't obviously go into a bunch of stuff, but mm -hmm. now after Sarah's condition, and there was no autopsy done on Mark, as, as we know, but, you know, maybe from some samples that were taken initially, um, you know, not the autopsy, but just, you know, because I know Mark had some substance on his face and things like that, and from samples there, it's, is there any reason that from samples taken, um, at the time of these, that there may be some kind of correlation or some kind of link, anything that may be similar in in, in those? I don't know. You, you don't know? No. And if there was? I wouldn't know. I understand you wouldn't know, but if, if, if there was, though, something similar amongst them. No clue. What would your explanation be, though? I don't know. What was 
Mark's life insurance policy like? Uh, he only had 20000 That was it. Okay. How about Sean? Sean only had fifteen. What about Sarah? Sarah only has fifteen, I believe. And Rachel? And Rachel has fifteen. And Brianna? Has fifteen. Okay. And you were able to get the, the money from Mark and Sean's, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. It took a while, but, took, yeah, but finally. You right. And what did you do with, with that money? Um, with Mark's, we were able to move into a better neighborhood. Right. How about Sean's? With Sean's, I haven't even... Right now, it's still in savings because I haven't quite figured out what to do yet. Okay. With some of it. What were your plans? Some things are... I'm thinking more of just paying off bills. Okay. What about Sarah's? If she passed, what was going to... I have no clue. Diane confirms that all four of her children had $15,000 life insurance policies, while Mark's policy was worth $20,000. This information is crucial for the police to comprehend the motives behind these tragic events. What raises concern is how well Diane has memorized these policies in detail and her swift responses. It's important to note that the family only had one single income source, and that was Diane herself. Detective McAmmis sought to better understand how the financial strain of raising children with special needs and other expenses might have contributed to the motive for these crimes. Let's get back to the medical stuff, you know, because of the the samples from tissues and mm -hmm. and fluids and everything else at the hospital are doing with Sarah. And then since because of that, they're going to go back, obviously, like I told you, and reevaluate to Sean's autopsy and the samples that have been saved since then. And again, you know, Mark having the same, you know, same deal. So how would you explain, how would, what would your be, what would be your explanation if there's something in their samples that comes back as being, you know, as if there is some kind of chemical or something that shouldn't be there of that nature. I really don't know. I know Sean and Sarah were very close. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, they, they talked a lot together. But what would that have to do with, I, with having some kind know. of substance? What would that have to do with some kind of substance, though, that shouldn't be there? I don't being, know. Okay. Really, I don't know. Okay. What, you wouldn't have any kind of explanation for that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think they're going to come back with anything like that? think so, but I don't know. And if they do? I'd have no clue. And you don't have any explanation as to why that would be? No. Oftentimes, you know, there, there's cases that come up that are similar to this, where mm -hmm. people are harmed, you know, by other people, and there's, there's always a reason. If somebody was to harm their, you know, let's their deaths were because of something like that. If somebody was to harm them, why do you think that would be? What would be the reason for them, for somebody to want to harm them? I don't know about my kids, but Mark had a lot of weird friends. Well, I don't know if I'd call them friends. Acquaintances. He would, you know, they were into drugs and all that, but that wouldn't surprise me, but as far as my kids, I can't imagine. You can't imagine? Anybody trying to harm them. Did you ever have any suspicion with Mark's death? Not really. I wouldn't call it suspicion. I, must, I was not surprised.
because he he would binge drink and. What was your his marriage like? Um. How can I say this? We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Have there been any infidelities on either side? He has. He has. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing then just briefly talking, he wasn't the best husband? Mm, probably not. Okay. Not not to society, no. What do you mean by that, not to society? Well, he was running around and he would drink and smoke pot and so he wasn't a very good guy is what Not, you're saying? Yeah. I know, you know, I've had friends who told me I should kick him out, but I couldn't find myself kicking him out. Why not? I was afraid he'd kill himself. Why is that though? Why would he kill himself? Oh, he was bipolar too. And even though things were bad and he wasn't a good husband and you said he wasn't good for society, that you didn't want him to kill himself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, even with all his faults, I still loved him. Okay. And Sean, any reason for anybody to want to harm Sean? I can't think of that. No. While Detective McCammons continues to press Diane with increasingly specific questions about hypothetical scenarios related to medical examinations, hinting towards her involvement, Diane consistently avoids them. In situations like this, suspects often believe that avoiding answers is their best strategy. However, what they may not realize is that trained detectives like Detective McAmis have the expertise to obtain confessions without direct confrontation. The more Diane decides to deflect the questions, the more it suggests her involvement in the case. In the later part of the previous clip, Diane shares her experiences in her marriage with Mark and expresses her deep care and love for him despite his flaws. What stands out, however, is her apparent lack of concern when Mark met an untimely death, raising suspicions about her indifference and laid-back attitude. Well, Ms. Stout, there's, there's been some things that have come up. We've been investigating this for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's been some things that have come up during the investigation. Some of it to do with some tests that have been done on Sarah. Okay. And then again, some of it from when we've started working with the doctors that had performed the autopsy. So there's some questions that need to be answered about, okay. about that. And I'm hoping that we can get an explanation because I know that you, um, from looking into the stuff and looking into you, I know that you are a, you know, that you're a God-fearing woman, you know, you're strong in the church, you know, very, very dedicated to the church. You're somebody that knows, um, you know, about the right thing and about God's way. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer myself, so I understand where you're coming from on that. Sometimes in life, there's things that happen or things that go on that may not, you know, good people don't normally always do, but there's reasons for, for sometimes people to slip up a little bit, make a mistake every now and then. You would agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are with this situation now where some stuff's been brought to our attention and I think you're a very good lady okay. with with the right intentions, right? Yeah, you try. I try. And but you know, sometimes you know everybody kind of reaches a, 
a tipping point or a breaking point and it gets gets to where you know again like I said that maybe certain decisions are made that normally wouldn't be made for that and with some of the stuff involved in these cases from what we've been looking at um, I think I think you're aware of, of why we're just why we're here maybe I don't know I think you know what why we're here talking and now is your chance to kind of help fill in you know because there are still are some questions about why things may have happened and mm -hmm. that nature and, and this is your opportunity because you know people are going to be looking for some answers and they're going to want to know why and we're going to want to be able to go back to them and say this is it you know she's a good person you know but you know, but give them some kind of explanation as to why because I know that there's a reason you know maybe why some of this stuff did happen and I, as far as Sarah I don't I don't know After providing several opportunities for Diane to come clean, Detective McAmis attempts to indirectly confront Diane one last time. He skillfully uses Diane's beliefs as a tool to put pressure on her. Detective McAmis shifts his approach from an interrogator to a sympathizer to get towards the truth. He says things she wants to hear and then focuses on the possibility that the test result wasn't looking good for Diane and asks for an explanation. Diane, unaware of the full extent of the investigation, remains silent, undermining her credibility. Let's get let's get past that thing, okay? Let's let's talk about it because I think I think you you probably want to talk about it. You need to talk about it because you know you know when when people you know do things, it's always good to ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know that, and oftentimes the best way to ask for forgiveness is to to talk about it and give an explanation as to why things happen. As far as, um, Sarah's a difficult child mm -hmm. to deal with. I understand. And I've been kind of putting pressure on her to, you know, you need to get out and get a job. Your college bills are coming due. I don't want to pay for them, I, you know. After all, you get tired of doing everything for your kids, and it's like you need to step up and do it. But as far as I don't know, as far as did I do something? to or I didn't do anything to or I mean I I guess I could have taken her to the ER sooner but I didn't know how would you explain if through everything that's been going on because I've been involved in this investigation for a while now and I've been working with the hospital mm -hmm. how would you explain Because the hospital has been, you know, like I said, working with me, and you may not be privy to know everything that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. How would you explain if something's been found that may indicate otherwise? I don't know. All I know is 
if she, I don't know. I know I didn't do anything. And if you did? I'm just telling you I didn't do anything. I mean, the only thing, maybe I could have taken her in sooner, but... Here's the deal. I'm here to try to help you out with all this because I know. Because I need all the help I can. I, I understand. I understand. I, I really do. And I know that this is. I know because you're a good person. I know that this is tearing you up. That this is bothering you. I truly understand that. But I'm here to help you out because I know that you don't want because of you being a good person. You don't want everybody out here when this all mm -hmm. comes out. You don't want them to, to think of you as a bad, evil type person mm -hmm. because I know that that's not how you are. But with that, that's why I'm here to try to help you out, to give you the opportunity to, to say, because I think I know, I think I know why. And it's for some of the reasons we've already talked about. If I think it's just pushed to the brink. Can't take it anymore. You know, you're doing all this stuff for everybody. You're working all the time. You're paying the bills. You're doing this. You're doing that. You can't get help. No jobs. You got all this other stuff. All these other burdens coming upon you where all of us get to a point where we just say, you know, enough is enough. And I understand that. I understand that. But you've got to... You gotta help me figure out. You gotta tell me this stuff. You gotta tell me why. That way we can get to that point. That's way when we can get it out there that you know what, this isn't just about somebody that's bad and evil. You you want people to know that it's that's not what it is. It just gets to the point, Diane. It's just it's just the breaking point. All of us, every one of us have it. By this point, Diane is on the verge of confessing, and the detective takes a compassionate approach, validating that her actions may have had genuine reasons. Sympathy in such situations always gives an advantage to detectives. He assures her that she isn't a heartless murderer, and that it might have been an outcome of a state of mind where she had just been overwhelmed. But at the same time, he constantly reminds her that he already knows details of the case, as he has been investigating it for quite a long time. He emphasizes that the only way to seek forgiveness is by admitting the truth. Despite her continuous verbal denials of any involvement in the poisoning of her family members, her body language and tone tell a different story. By now, it is clear from her words that she has been struggling with significant stress, juggling the roles of breadwinner and caregiver simultaneously. That, that's, it's, it's just as simple as that, Diane. It's just, we all have that. It just, we get right there, and then, I mean, all the burdens that you have to have on you, and that's what I'm giving you the chance, Diane. That's why we're here today, is so you can tell me. So you can tell me so we can get it all on the table. It'll be that weight that'll be lifted off your shoulders because I know people that, especially good people like yourself, that walk around and carry this kind of stuff, carry these kind of burdens. Um, so many times just talking about it, to get it out there and say, here's the deal. I did this because, because I had all this going on. And then it'll just, it'll be a relief to be able to talk about it, to get it off your shoulders and then to help with the forgiveness and the healing process. But you have to, you have to do it. That's why I'm here. You have to sit down just like we're doing and talk about it and get it all out there. You do know I'm that. Afraid you do. Know, I know. I know. I know you're afraid of going to jail. But that's that. You shouldn't even be thinking about that right now. I know. But that's how my mind works. I understand. I understand. But let's put that out of your mind because you shouldn't even be thinking about that. Okay. I understand you're afraid to go to jail. Well, we're not going to even think about that because that's got nothing to do with it. Now is your chance to to tell us why, and and to show some remorse and ask for forgiveness. And that way, I can go to these other people and say, yeah. She made some mistakes and that was it. So tell me about it, Diane. There's a lot of arguments. And to put it really short and sweet, 
I knew they were drinking antifreeze. And I was so mad at them, I didn't want to take them in. I delayed. And why'd you delay? Because I was mad. And that would just eliminate those problems, wouldn't it? They wouldn't be there to nag you, to bug you, to talk bad to you, to be mean to you, to be disrespectful to you. That would just be a problem that's gone. Yeah. I guess you could say that, but, right. but Diane, problems never go away. Right. How'd you know they were drinking in a freeze, Diane? They told me. Diane. You better, you know, you, I want you to understand this, okay? I want you to understand where we're at at this point. Okay? Right now, because I, I know you're scared. I completely understand that. I, I 110% understand that you're scared. But Diane, right now is not the time to tell me things that aren't true. Because it all comes back to, again, when other people, not me, but when other people that are going to see this, look at this and go, did she come in and tell the truth? Or did she lie, 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 and lie? Okay? You have to understand there's going to be a lot of people that look at this, and you don't want them to see all these lies. You and I both know why you knew they were drinking antifreeze, and you need to tell me about that. And lying about it, Diane will not help you. You know that. You don't need me to tell you that. You need to... T I know how you knew they were drinking antifreeze. And you need to tell me. How I knew they were drinking it? Because I saw them drinking it. You need to tell me the whole truth, Diane. And you know we're looking at each other eye to eye right now. You know that I know. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I wouldn't have showed up on your door today. Mm -hmm. Because when we've been investigating for a while, and we had to make sure that everything was as it was appearing, that's why we waited. And then I showed up today to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And Diane, right now, because you're a good person, you're better than this. People that come in here and are not completely truthful with me are the bad people. Mm -hmm. And you're not one of those. We need to get past all this stuff. I understand you're scared. I completely understand that. But we got to get past this, Diane, because there's going to be lots of other people that see this and look at this. And you got to tell the truth, the whole truth. I know why you need to tell it. Why they were drinking it, or? I know how they were drinking it. Yeah. You need to tell the whole story, Diane. People will look at this, and you, and you have to understand, just as a, as a person on the outside, when you look at this, if you're sitting and you look, did this person come in and say, you know what, I'm sorry, what I did was wrong. And this is why I did it, and this is how I did it. And they they put it all out on the table to get it over with. Usually people look at that and go, you know what? They made a mistake. But they owned up to it, and they did the right thing. Or do you have somebody that comes in and tries to not tell the whole truth? that says this or that, but it's not the whole truth. And people know that. When then people see that, they go, you know what, she, she made some mistakes, but then she tried to not tell the whole truth about it. I'm not quite sure that person's as good as what we thought. So, you have to understand that, Diane. You've got to tell me the whole truth, because you know that I already know. But you've got to tell me how 
how all this started, when it started, why it started. Because you're going to want people to see that you're remorseful and that, you know, you're sorry for what you did. And that you've asked for forgiveness. Diane, you knew that they were drinking antifreeze. Mm -hmm. You knew that. They didn't. Following a comprehensive investigation, detectives conducted a search of the Stouty household. Ethylene glycol, an organic compound utilized in the manufacturing of polyester fibers and as an ingredient in antifreeze formulations, was discovered. This odorless, colorless, flammable, syrupy liquid has a sweet taste, but is highly toxic in concentrated doses. It was found mixed with Coca-Cola in the bottles in the Stouty residence in the garage. Despite Detective McAmis directly confronting Diane this time, she persistently denies involvement, giving dishonest explanations to uphold her facade until the very last moment. Her efforts fail as the detective accurately pinpoints that Diane herself had been mixing antifreeze into the coat. We both know that. You knew, Diane, that they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. Were you just at, just like we talked, were you just at the breaking point? Yeah. I didn't know what else to do. How long had you been giving them the antifreeze before they finally got, like before Sean passed and before Sarah got to the point that she was? Maybe a couple of days. And what were you putting it in? Coca-Cola. What else? I think that was it. How much would you put in? I don't know. Just a little bit. And why just a little bit? I, I didn't want to hurt them. So you pour them the coke and then while you pour them the coke, that's when you put the antifreeze in the coke. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long did you think it would take to before they finally would pass? I had no clue. When they weren't passing right away, did you eventually start to give them more and more? How, how often? Was this was this every day? Or how many times a day, I guess I should say? Once a day. Once a day? Yeah. And you say it started out with a couple tablespoons, but then when it wasn't killing them, then it, maybe it moved on to just a little bit more and more? Maybe. I don't remember. How long ago did you start with Sarah to give her the antifreeze? weeks ago. Okay. Diane finally admits her involvement in the crime as Detective McAmis practically lays it out for her. Balancing the responsibility for the well-being of numerous children with challenges and an irresponsible husband, Diane found herself stressed and exhausted. She explains that she felt she had no other choice. She didn't want her family to suffer. However, the story doesn't conclude here. It's not as straightforward as it may seem. Let's delve deeper and continue to follow Detective McAmis on this journey. There's more ongoing testing, obviously, and there's going to be some more ongoing testing. But we felt at this point <clears throat> that it was time um, to have a talk with your mom. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I uh, brought your mom in today <clears throat> and interviewed her at length uh, for quite a long time. And um, basically what has happened is your mom has admitted to killing your dad and your brother and trying to kill your sister with poison. I know it's hard to process and a hard thing to even think about, but um, she basically spelled out to us how she did this and the reasons for doing it. Um, we had got some information early on that they're like, um, as far as your sister goes, that this, this lady has been poisoned. It's, it's not a medical thing. It's not a genetic thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's a leaning more towards the lines of a foul play thing. So I uh, brought your mom in today and talked to her. And um, after talking to her for a while, <clears throat> she, um, she finally told us what she had been doing. Um, she had been giving your father uh, small doses of, anti of antifreeze in his drinks. Um, over a several period, over several day period, um, same thing with your brother, and uh, same thing with your sister Sarah. Um, I know it's very difficult, and obviously we don't think that you or your sister had any knowledge, obviously, of that. Um, your mom is is um, obviously she's torn up over the whole thing, and, and mentally she's she's beat herself up over it. I'm sure. interview, 22-year-old Rachel Stoudy was informed about her mother's role in poisoning their family members. Although Diane confessed to her actions and asserted that Rachel was unaware of the incidents, she failed to grasp that the investigation had its own evidence to suggest otherwise. Her response to the news is more complex than it appears, filled with various emotions and reasons. Let's watch it closely. Did you ever have any suspicions about anything when your dad and brother and sister got sick? In hindsight now, yeah. I mean... Now that I think on it, yes, but God, it's hard to even imagine something like that. Mm -hmm. If there were, as I'd really hit it well, I don't. It's just hard to think that somebody would do that, so I. <laughs> it makes sense now, but God. Didn't even think about that then. Kind of tell me about the deal with your dad. How did, how did everything happen with that? So he really was... sudden. Okay, so he was he was pretty much fine, and then you say then all of a sudden he gets sick, he didn't yeah. want to eat, and then he started throwing up. Was he throwing up for three or four days? Just about. It wasn't very long, though. When you say it wasn't very long, what do you mean? Like three or four days. Like... When I get sick, usually I'm out for like a week throwing okay. up. I know, it's a bit weird to think about it in terms of me versus how others get sick, but to me, three or four days is not that long, but... At this point, it's evident that Detective McAmis is cautious in discussing matters about which he is not certain. When questioned about her involvement in assisting her mother with the crime, Rachel vehemently denies the accusations. Her body language and choice of words clearly conveys her desire to appear innocent. However, she lacks specific details in her responses, such as mentioning seeing things from hindsight, which raises questions about the vagueness of her answers and encourages the detectives to dig deeper. In this situation, the detective employs a different strategy. Did she ever talk about anything else along those lines? Not no. Mm. So she did she so she never told you specifically that she wanted to hurt your dad, your brother, or your sister. No. Yeah. Did she ever say anything to you about um, maybe your, maybe any of them being in bad health and that they were going to die in the near future or anything at all like that? Yeah. She did? Like as far as like dad, when he was 
smoking and drinking is mm-hmm. like if he keeps up on this, he's not going to be around to make 80, 90. Okay. Anything else? Or was that pretty much? That's pretty much it. Never anything about your brother or Sarah? No. Okay. Do you recognize this? Yeah, I remember this. Okay. What is that? Little journal thing. A journal thing? Whose journal? Mine. Your journal? So you wrote this then, is what you're telling me? Okay. You remember writing this then, is what you're saying? Uh Okay. Take a look at this. Is that your same journal that we were just talking about that you were writing? dream that I had had that they would die but this is your journal yeah you wrote this mm. and you remember writing it yeah okay did you get to read it all mm. got some questions for you Rachel okay. some questions that you need to be honest with me about Detective McCamus leaves no room for escape as he confronts Rachel, systematically eliminating any potential excuses she might employ. He makes Rachel admit that there were no significant health concerns in Mark, Sean, or Sarah before they died, or were in critical condition. While the investigation is ongoing, detectives in the Stoudy residence discover a personal journal belonging to Rachel. The journal entry that Rachel is shown in this interrogation reads, It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months. Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. It will be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. Mom also said that I get to have Dad's car when he's gone. Okay. Now, Rachel, we need to talk about this. And again, I appreciate you being truthful with me. What we just talked about. But you're going to have to continue to be truthful with me. Are we understood? So you said you'd been having some dreams about them dying. And you told your mother about this. Mm-hmm. What did you tell your mother? That it would be quick. That... It'd be easy. <laughs> that they'd be to heaven soon and... <laughs> We could move on. I didn't know when she bought the antifreeze, but I knew she'd been doctoring drinks. Rachel doesn't take very long to accept her involvement after Detective McAmmis catches her pretense and exposes her so efficiently. She admits to her role and mentions that she asked Diane to make the poisoning process swift and painless. At this juncture, it suggests nothing but an attempt to downplay her role in this crime. However, the evidence in Detective McAmmis' possession doesn't lend much support to her attempt. Watch how this detective breaks every single wall of deceit that the mother-daughter duo has built. Rachel, whose idea was this? Mom brought it up, I mean, then we discussed, but... So you and Mom are close enough. You guys are, just like we talked about earlier, you guys are best, you know, close enough friends and, you know, mother-daughter that you guys have a tight enough bond that you guys could discuss this. Mm -hmm. And she was the one to bring it up? Yeah. What did she say to you? Um, Basically went through different options. Um, Was trying to find things that wouldn't be traceable or at least would be hard to trace if you didn't know what you were looking for. I remember her searching online, though. I remember. What kind of searches did she do for that? A lot of Google search. A lot of, um... She mentioned once how to kill characters. Like, if you're writing stories, you could actually look up something like that. And she'd get ideas from it. Um... Did you guys do these searches together? 
No, she happened to mention it. So she told you that she was doing these searches? Yeah. <sighs> so when she told you this, what did you say? Other than it was disturbing and kind of creepy, um... <laughs> Don't know. I was quite uncomfortable with it. Mm. I mean, well, obviously, Rachel, you guys got to the point where something was agreed upon. Why did you guys want to kill them? Sean, I accepted that she wanted him gone, but I really didn't think he was necessary. And I really actually wasn't aware that she was getting Sarah. I knew about Sean, I knew about Dad, but I didn't know she was going to go ahead with Sarah. Did Sarah know what was going to happen to your dad and your brother? Probably not. Probably not? No. Or, or probably so. What did I say about let's be honest about everything and get it out on the table? Because, again, you've already seen I've spoken with your mother this morning. So you need to be honest about everything. It's very possible she could have overheard. Did Sarah know, yes or no? Yes. Dad and then Sean. Dad and then Sean. And you said you guys did research on the Internet on types of poisons that could not be detectable if you weren't looking for them or they would be difficult to find. And you talked about poisonous plants mm -hmm. and cyanide. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. Did you do any searches? No. We have your computer. What are we going to find on your computer? You need to be honest about everything. Okay. I don't... I want to sit here and, and be decent with you. You got to tell me everything, though. Okay, we're going to find it. It's better for you to get this is your chance, Rachel. Some mistakes were made, obviously. You guys didn't make the best decisions, but we're here now, and now's the time to deal with it because there's stuff that we already know, there's stuff that we're going to know, there's stuff we need to know, and we need to get this all done right now. Okay. What kind of searches did you do? Death related in general. Death related in general. Specifically, I can't remember, but if you pull up the thing, I'll remember, because <laughs> I can't remember specifically. Okay, but in death in general, I mean, what does that mean? How to kill someone. How to kill someone. Okay, so when you're looking up how to kill someone, what what did you come up with? Um, Tylenol, suffocation. I can't remember exactly. There's a lot of browsing. Um. Rachel makes a consistent effort to claim the moral high ground by acknowledging her discomfort with the plan. However, her journal entries, the evidence, and her own words have begun to work against her. Rachel's body language and tone have notably shifted as the confrontations leave little room for her to construct alternate narratives apart from the truth. During this point, Rachel also confesses that Sarah was aware of the plan to harm Mark and Sean, indicating Sarah's involvement. This prompts the question of what led Diane and Rachel to betray Sarah. So when did the plan to kill Sarah come about? Um, May, June. May or June. And so why did, was it decided to kill Sarah? Other than the fact that she basically lived in the back bedroom and didn't, like, have any gumption to get a job, I'm not certain. Mom probably has her own issues with her. What about you? She's annoying, yes, but I don't know. 
Did you guys fight a lot? Yeah. Your mother told me you guys fought all the time. Is that true? Yeah. Is that why you wanted Sarah gone? Mm. Why did you want Sarah dead? Back in middle school, she would touch me. I mean, she grew up later when she got on the medicine, but she still argues. She still has really inappropriate jokes. She... She really had no purpose. No purpose in life? Not really, no. Okay. A critical moment of deception unfolds here. Initially, Rachel claimed she didn't know about her mother poisoning Sarah and attempted to come across shocked. However, she failed to maintain consistency in her lies and inadvertently revealed the timeline of when the mother-daughter duo began planning to harm Sarah. Rachel's confession that Sarah was aware of the plan to harm Mark and Sean, coupled with Sarah abusing Rachel when they were young, raises troubling concerns. Nevertheless, it seems important for Rachel to cast Sarah in a negative light to justify their actions. Detective McCamus recognizes the possibility of this situation, so he doesn't delve further into this topic. Interestingly, Rachel didn't bring this up in court, making it clear that it was just another excuse she had hoped to cling to. It was clear that Diane wanted no burdens, and her actions speak clearly, but the question here is, what made them take Sarah to the hospital? Let me ask you this, why did you guys, because I've spoken to your mom about this, and I'd like to know why you guys eventually took, you know, when Sarah got so bad, I know you guys said you thought that she was pretty much dead, but why did you take her to the hospital? I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. Okay, and what does that mean? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? I get a lot of nightmares. Like okay. after Sean died, I moved into his room and it was awful, awful, awful in there. I kept feeling things in there. I just didn't want that again. Guilt can be tormenting, but betrayal can push someone to the brink of madness. Rachel's experience in Sean's room after his death was primarily a tumultuous cocktail of guilt over betraying someone close to her. While her behavior here might seem irrational on the outside, her vocal tone and erratic body language hint at a different story. It shows the sheer panic and fear she felt while remembering the experience of that night. It's clear in these lines. Yet I feel your gaze lingering over me. I close my eyes and try not to think of the ghost of copper and bleach on my tongue. I try not to think of shuddering breaths or how easily a soul evaporates, leaving nothing behind but a hollow husk curled up on the floor, eyes vacant and dull, arms extended. But what were you reaching for? As chilling as it sounds, these feelings made Rachel traumatized, and as a result, the plan changed to let Sarah die in the hospital, not at home. So it's safe to say that the decision to bring Sarah to the hospital was driven by fear rather than compassion. While we're on the topic of journal stuff, I guess, you know, after we arrested you, when we had to search your purse, you know, we found your new journal entry, some of the stuff that you'd written in there, and I've got some of that talking about how you felt, you know, kind of bad, uh, about Sarah's pain because you helped basically put her in the position she was. And um, so did you feel bad then? Because you, you wrote that you felt a little bit bad about knowing that you helped put her in that much pain. So did you feel kind of bad about that or? It's harder when you're watching in the ER. She would scream out. I don't like screaming. Okay. So that that was harder, it would have just been easier for you if she just would have died and not having to see all that? Yeah. Okay. And then you wrote a little poem at the end of that. Do you remember that? How did that poem go? 
I've read about the nurses a little bit. Right. And it's like, they make you feel stupid. Mm -hmm. You remember at the very end of that writing what you wrote about? Something to the effect that I know what's happening. Mm. Something like this. It said, once upon a time there were six, and now there are only three. Only the quiet ones are left. My mom, my little sister, and me. When did you write that? Um... A little bit after she was put in the hospital, like, um, when she was still on the ICU floor. Okay. You still thought she was going to die at that point? Yeah. Okay. Because you said she, you were really surprised that she pulled through. Mm-hmm. Do you regret not waiting a little bit longer? Before you guys took her? If it would have been a little less painless, yeah. It's intriguing how both Diane and Rachel desired their family members to pass away in silence rather than endure pain. They couldn't bear to witness their loved ones suffering, even though they intended to kill them by poisoning them. Diane, being a dedicated follower of the Redeemer Lutheran Church, didn't hesitate to kill her own family members just out of spite and made her favorite child her own accomplice. But as they say, the truth will always prevail. Remember the anonymous tip that the homicide department received after Sarah was hospitalized? It was none other than the pastor, Jeff Sippy, of the church where Diane attended. It is almost a coincidence that even Rachel's practice of journaling her emotions and intentions played a pivotal role in aiding the investigation to uncover the truth more effectively her own words ended up exposing her. Later, Rachel accepts that both Diane and her considered getting rid of Brianna, the youngest of the Stouty siblings, as she had learning disabilities and it was bothersome for the family to function appropriately. Thus, a fourth attempted murder could have taken place in the future. Brianna's name was changed and she was put into foster care. Sarah recovered from the critical condition. Although she was out of danger, she endured permanent organ and brain damage and remains in assisted living. As the truth emerged, the mother-daughter pair faced legal proceedings. Rachel Stoudy pleaded guilty in May 2015 to two counts of second-degree murder and one count of first-degree assault. She received two life sentences with the chance of parole after 42 and a half years. Her mother, Diane Stoudy, entered guilty pleas for two counts of murder in January 2016 and received a life sentence without the chance of parole. Sarah came to the trial and her words to the mother were as direct as their attempt to murder her. I prefer to be a survivor than a victim. I forgive my mom for what she did to me, but she not only took away my dad and brother, but she took away my lifestyle, livelihood, and my independence. After witnessing the intense interrogations of Diane and Rachel Stoudy, we've come face to face with a truly unsettling story of betrayal within a family. These two seemingly normal family members were involved in a plot that caused great harm and claimed not one, but three lives. Now, as we wrap up their story, we can't help but wonder, what could push them to do such extreme things? How does one deal with the moral and emotional turmoil of causing harm to those they hold dear? This case reminds us that the most surprising truths can emerge in an interrogation room with one detective who is dedicated enough to bring out the truth. It leaves us thinking about the complexity of human behavior, the blurred lines of loyalty, and the disturbing lengths people will go to in their quest for self-preservation. Tell us how you felt about this case and suggest cases you would like us to cover in the comments section below. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more such content.